Hello everyone, I am Dr. Maria Espinola. I am a clinical psychologist. And today's video is the second video that I am going to release on race and the Black Lives Matter movement. Today's topic is self-care, specifically for women of color who engage in advocacy efforts. In order to discuss this topic, I invited Dr. Anissa Shomo and Tarita Preston. Dr. Anissa Shomo is a family medicine physician, an assistant professor at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, and the director of Family Medicine Scholars. Tarita Preston is a performance coach and an expert in leadership and organizational development. A lot of women are engaging in advocacy efforts through the Black Lives Matter movement, the immigrant rights movement, and the Me Too movement. Engaging in advocacy can feel very empowering and also help trauma survivors in the healing process. Now, there are times when engaging in advocacy can also feel exhausting. So what do you think is the best way to balance advocacy and self-care? Uh, just understand <coughs> that the way you advocate is not gonna look the same as everybody. So I think that that's what help, hurts people too, is that they feel like they have to do it one way. You can do a lot of, there's a lot of ways to contribute to a lot of causes. There are, um, there's, there's a lot of ways that you can contribute to a cause. And because I know some people, you know, we got a pandemic going on, so not everybody wants to be marching, but some, yeah. so some people are donating money. So some people are um, trying to talk about different things on Facebook. Some people are doing, basically just doing whatever you can. Sometimes it's just sharing your story. Yep. So for me, you know, I can't be out here in a pandemic um, doing the most. So I sit at home and I use my social media as my weapon. Mm -hmm. And I have talked about the narrative of my father being a janitor, even though he has a college degree, and being afraid to die at the hand of the police. I, even though I'm a doctor, it doesn't mean I don't have a black father. And that doesn't mean that I don't have a black mother. And that doesn't mean I don't have black nephews and a black husband. You know what I mean? So it's just like being aware that your voice, even on social media, what you say on social media can be very powerful and so this week I actually shared somebody said you know talking about the police and all that sort of thing and then somebody was just saying well if you follow the rules then the police won't bother you and I'm like I already know that personally I was like I already know that just as a society that's not true but I'm like let me tell you a story let me tell you a story about my life because you think that I've done everything perfectly when I was in middle school I, my mom was on drugs and my parents got divorced and I didn't know my mom was on drugs. She was a functional addict and I was trying to go to school and school was a mile away and I had to walk there. They didn't have any school buses. I had to walk there and it started at 7.30, which meant I had to get up at 6.30 in the morning as a 13 year old child with only one parent at this time. And my sisters were having kids so they, I was pretty much like the oldest in the house at this point. And I was depressed because I had never been around, you know, I had ever lived in a single parent home and that sort of thing. So it's one thing to grow up that way. It's a whole other thing to have a huge life change, right? So I was late to school often. And sometimes I would be like two minutes late. And instead of them being like, well, you know, try to be on time or how can we help you get to school on time? That sort of thing. Maybe somebody lives in your neighborhood. Maybe you can get a ride. Instead of them trying to have any kind of creative solutions to this problem, they would send me to in-school suspension every oh. like almost every day it got to the point where i was in, in school suspension more than i was in school and it's just wow. like so guess what i did i stopped going to school yeah right. i stopped going to school i failed eighth grade and i'm just like this is what happens to people you beat them down so much yeah that they don't feel like doing that anymore yep. and so many people are like damn what like, you know what i mean like like you it happened to you really. <laughs> I know how you feel because especially when we get in this conversation of racism doesn't exist or or better yet it only happens to certain people and right. I wrote a whole post about yeah I'm a professional I think people know me in Cincinnati I like I'm coaching people twice my age and, yeah. and vice presidents and I'm like wait a minute I've had a group of white girls chase me in my car and mm -hmm. run me off the road and call me the n-word and a monkey mm -hmm. like this was recent don't think that it doesn't like it's me and right. they're like oh my god yeah it doesn't just happen in like the hood <laughs> like mm -hmm. where i'm from let's be clear <laughs> like right. so that was in the suburbs yeah like, we had we actually had gotten so i grew up in my parents owned their house when my parents got divorced we were on section 8 housing in the suburbs and in the suburbs it was like you better be perfect 
or we're gonna send you to in-school suspension every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know what the crazy part about the whole thing is? This is why you should pretty much do whatever the hell you want to do and live your life on your terms. Because <laughs> people are projecting on you. So when people write the stuff about, well, if you just follow the rules, really internally, they have a inner, they have a they, chaotic inner, yeah. inner um, life where they restrict and confine themselves. They judge themselves. So when someone's really adamant about that, especially at these riots and protests when they're hysterical, and that's historical. They already have their own deep-seated issues, and now they're projecting that on you. This is why when you want to talk about like growing into your power, being a fully congruent human being, that's a practice and this whole thing is you going out there and really finding yourself, regardless of what other people say, think or feel. Yeah. And I also share the part of it where I regathered myself and went to go live with my dad. He advocated for myself and said, I'm not about to do this anymore. Let's go live with my dad. And I got 4.0. The whole and I'm just like I was the same that's person. <laughs> I was the same person who felt eighth grade, who also had a 4.0 right. the rest of high school because I had a ride to school. You know what yep. I mean? It's just like, yep. it's just mm -hmm. that simple for a lot of people. It is. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing. So, you know, your social media can really be powerful. Your voice can really be powerful. And so everybody can do it in different ways. Sometimes people write articles to yeah. papers. Mm -hmm. There's just all types of ways that you can share your stories. And you can humanize the experience that we all have because yeah. I think that's the issue. It's like this is the human experience. This is the human experience. We all go through things, but we we try to shelter ourselves from that pain of sometimes sometimes it's painful being a human, and sometimes we need to help each other more. But instead of thinking about that empathy, we try to victim blame. We do a lot of victim blaming in yeah. the U.S. Yeah, but I just I mean I just have you know it's one of those things. I wouldn't say I was a victim. I went through a lot of things in my life that were traumatic. Um, and I won't, I won't say that I refuse to be a victim, but I just use it as like, I had empathy with myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like things happen. Life isn't perfect. Sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes things happen. Mm -hmm. And so I have to forgive myself. I think yeah. a lot of times people have a hard time forgiving my, themselves. And I have to sh have that same forgiveness in a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, I think that that is what is hard about our society is we, we do try so hard to say everybody needs to be perfect all the time. And it's like, that's not how we are as humans. We make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So we have to try to figure out how to be a more compassionate society. Yeah, and that, to your point, it starts with how we treat ourselves. Back to self-care. Right. <laughs> came full circle on right, you. Right, right. right. Yeah. It's like when you serve yourself and are compassionate with yourself, you make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, so the treatment that I use is based on self-compassion, so that's the first thing I, in my... It's kind of like when thinking about, okay, what's the, oh, the priorities, right? I mean, I think, like, yeah, definitely the number one is probably self-compassion. And then what else comes to mind by, like, in terms of priorities to build up a... I think we should add self-forgiveness too because mm -hmm. you know how many people walk around to your point not wanting to forgive stuff they did yeah. 10 years ago mm -hmm. yesterday it's like yes. I like to treat myself like I'm a three-year-old it's okay baby right yeah. <laughs> what is Tarita on today <laughs> <laughs> I love that yes yes yeah so it, sometimes I tell people like okay so like therapy is like almost it can help you build up that compassionate voice in your mind mm -hmm. which could feel like a like a compassionate mother it's like okay that didn't go nurturing. well but mm -hmm. nurturing. Uh, we're gonna try again yeah and like tomorrow is gonna be a better day yeah i tell my clients like <laughs> what would your fantasy mom say right now right ah okay yeah so and i want to be clear right? we aren't talking about anybody's mom like i'm not saying your mom's <laughs> not great but it's like if you because our because our parents um they, no one can love you the way you need to be loved. That's your job. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? So exactly. it's like if you if your fantasy mom like met your needs all the time in whatever way you needed to be, what would they be doing and saying right now? Mm -hmm. You could be providing that for yourself. Exactly. And what I do and just from where I've come from, in addition to having compassion for myself, I, so, I often have to work with affirmations too and build mm -hmm. myself up. Of, yeah. This is going to be fine. Because sometimes you do get that feeling like this is going to be terrible. But you do have to take those times and just tell yourself everything's going to be okay, I'm okay, and just talk to yourself in a kind, compassionate way. So I would encourage anybody when they're going through all of this 
to just start trying to practice that having that inner voice that is kind and compassionate towards yourself yeah so um, I tell my clients it's important to really slow down like slow down in all way shape or form and when we slow down we really start to address what's in the way so I think it's really easy for us to kind of tell people well you know just like sometimes do what makes you happy but what I tend to find is that people have issues with taking care of themselves because it's, it's been ingrained not to do that mm -hmm. so um, you could look at your relationship with guilt lots mm -hmm. of people feel guilty when they want to take care of themselves yeah. so what's happening inside of you where nurturing yourself and finding that space makes you feel a certain way that'd be a great place to start to look what's in the way of your self-care other people um, put other people before themselves well, they may be disappointed or um, or really, and this, this, might be, this might be triggering a few people, you like being needed. You like being needed. You wanna be the person that helps. And you, it's like a collapsing belief of, um, in order to serve, in order to help, I have to be a servant. As in, you know, the greatest good is for all these people, but it doesn't include me, right? Why aren't, the greatest good includes you too. And um, what I tend to find is, you know, energy in is energy out. So if I'm depleted, um, that's the energy I'm giving out into the world. It doesn't work that way. And when we don't take care of ourselves, our boundaries are just kind of all over the place. Yes. <laughs> and, it, and it makes it harder. Right. And yeah. um, we, I mean, we say this all the time, and I'm sure you see it too with your clients, like, well, I know that I can't get from an empty cup. I know that. Yeah. And I just challenge, like, listen, when we know something, we do it. Mm -hmm. You know it to be true. And it's in action. And if you're still saying you know it, but there's no action, then I would question if you really knew it. I would say I completely agree with you. And that's what for me has been helpful in this whole situation is that I had to learn that the hard way. So in 2017, I was diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I'm fine now, I was treated. And it wasn't really a big treatment that I had to have, um, but it still was really a hard emotional thing to go through, of course. And for me, that was my moment when I was just like, why am I all of these places? Why am I doing all these things for people? I'm like, I have cancer right now and there's nobody here. Mm -hmm. The only person who's here with me is my husband. And so that was for me a time when I was just like, I have a problem with feeling like I need to be everywhere and I need to be everybody's everything. Yep. And I need to stop. Yep. And I, ha I mean, I had made a lot of boundaries in my family a long time ago because I have a big family and people always need something. But in that moment, it was still just like, I am trying to be too many places and do too many things. So I had a lot of, at that moment, I was just like, I need to sit down. Mm -hmm. And so I had to practice doing that. And so when this pandemic came, I was like, well, I'm just gonna read books, clean my house, <laughs> go for some do runs, what's helpful for you know me. what I mean? Yeah. So I just tried to continue to focus on myself. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the big things too, is as women, we, we are socialized to live our lives for other people. Yeah. It's, you know, you live your life for, like when I was young, my, my dad had a business, so I spent a lot of time taking care of his business, um, helping him with his business. I ran his business at the age of like 15. Mm -hmm. So it's like you, you know, you spend a lot of time tied up with your dad, and then of course a lot of people get married young, so then they have, they live their lives for their children, they live their lives for their husband, and it's just like, what about living your life for you? What do you want out of your life? Um, and what it makes you happy and so I think a lot of a lot of women do feel guilty about that though about you know well if I live my life for myself who's gonna do all of these other things it's like they will learn how to do them things themselves mm -hmm. <laughs> that's really good yeah so like in psychology we study gender socialization so I specialize on women's issues so one of the main things that we study is gender socialization so I those are all the messages that you receive growing up about what's what it's like to be a girl, what girls should do, what women should do, what boys and men should do. And those messages stick with us. Yes. Like, and, and it's really like, um, and then they're everywhere. I mean, they are in fairy tales, they are in the schools, they are in families, they are in books, they are everywhere. And it's so hard because they get like, they become part of how you see yourself and how you see the world. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard to take that down. Mm -hmm. So what type of messages do you receive growing up about what women should do? I think that what the message that I received was just that we should be martyrs, that we should always die on the cross for everybody else and if we die then at least we save the world you know what mm -hmm. I mean so I think that you know you learn a lot of those kind of messages that you should put everything above yourself and I can't say that I've always done that. I've done that a lot 
but I've also over years have learned a lot of boundaries as well like I did quit working for my dad before I even graduated high school I quit working for him when I was like 16 I'm like dad I'm gonna go get a job mm. somewhere else <laughs> so I'm old enough else. now I can go here. work somewhere else uh-huh. Not here. so I think that for me you know I've been working on that for a long time but I know that a lot of a lot of people don't feel empowered to do that and so I work on the admissions committee for the medical school and I see that so often. I see a lot of young women who apply to medical school and their family guilted them into staying home with them, mm-hmm. staying going mm-hmm. working in their businesses mm-hmm. and then they didn't have time to focus. I mean they had good grades but they don't have any activities outside mm-hmm. of that family business. Um, which for me, I'm like, still admit that person, but it can be hard sometimes to convince other people who don't have the experience that I have of living that. Um, so, you know, they sometimes shoot themselves in the foot by listening to what their families, to basically enwrap, wrapping themselves in their family's dreams instead of their own. And so for me, you know, I said when I was 18, I, when I was young, so in addition to working in my parents' business, well, my dad, at that point, when I was in high school, my parents were divorced, so it, it was only my dad's business at that point. And so, one of the things that I did, in addition to that, was babysit. Like, I have five older sisters, and they have, they had, they didn't have a ton of kids in it. There were maybe, I don't know, I had like seven or eight nephews at the wow. time. Now there's like 30. So, <laughs> so, wow. and counting, because there's another baby on the way right now. Right. So, I have a lot of nieces and nephews, and so I was babysitting all the time. And I remember at one point, I said, if I stay here and keep babysitting everybody's kids, even though I wasn't working for my dad anymore, I said, I'm never going to graduate college. Like, my sisters are, you know, I mean, they were just trying to live and make it. If they had somebody who was going to babysit their kids for free, they were going to bring you their kids because they were just trying to make it. But I'm just like, this is not going to work out for me. I, in the end, I need to go away to school. Because if I stay here, because I had a full ride to Case in Cleveland, and I was like, I can't go to Case. I need to go somewhere else. And I had to choose myself. And I think a lot of times, a lot of young women get wrapped into taking care of their family and taking care of everybody and that sort of thing. Like we are, we are socialized to be caregivers to everybody. Right. And I think that at a lot of times, we are the people who suffer the most from taking care of everybody but ourselves. That's true. Yeah. It's like, so if, if someone says like, okay, okay, that's it. I make my decision. I'm done. It's over. I'm going to start a new life now and I'm going to put myself uh, first. Uh, how does that person start, basically? What do you think is the most important thing? I would say for people to dream. I think that for me, that's one of the biggest things that's been important in my whole life is that I had a goal of what I wanted to do. And so when I told my family, I'm out, <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I'm going to follow my dream, you know? Mm-hmm. So if it's, if you don't, if you don't know what that is, if you don't know what your passion is, um, I mean, sometimes people's dream is just to, to leave that place and have their own and have their own apartment or have their own car, that sort of thing. So it can just be something small. Yep. Um, so just having something to dream for um, and just trying to work toward it. And I think that just giving yourself permission to to go for it. I think that a lot of people do feel a lot of guilt, like they don't feel like they're worthy of going mm-hmm. after their dreams. They don't feel like they deserve a lot of things. So it's just one of those things that number one, dream number two go after your dreams number three know that you are worthy of accomplishing your dreams and and that sometimes the dreams change too and i think that that's one of the things too that sometimes like in michelle obama's book so i have a book club too so i read a lot of books um so in her book she talked about how she dreamed of being a lawyer went and did all the things that she was a box checker and then she got there and she was just like why did i dream about this (laughs) enjoy this you know what I mean so it's kind of like and feel free to change those dreams (laughs) to dream again Mm -hmm. to reshape your dreams to modify the dreams and continue to go after whatever it is that you want to go after Mm -hmm. yeah I often see we'll make a goal reach the goal and then or use the goal to weaponize it against ourselves like oh I didn't do it I made myself wrong you just you made it up (laughs) like you could pick something else So what I say is like, the first thing is that you you have to prioritize yourself. It's just not possible. 
Because even in the work that you do, if we're doctors, if we're life coaches, if we're psychologists, if this isn't good, we're gonna be leaking onto our clients. We won't have energy to sustain them. We won't have energy to hold space, to support, to have good ideas because we're tired, we're drained. It doesn't work that way. So it's like, you really wanna to start to fill your own cup. Cause then you give from your overflow and there's never, there's always to give from the overflow. So that's the first thing I'm gonna say to you. Yeah. I do think that there are times though when, when that guilt does come. Like my dad to this day will still say, my business has never been the same since you left and went to college. Like, so you didn't want me to go to college and become yeah. a doctor? You know? right. <laughs> and I've seen, especially as women physicians, I've seen a lot of uh, women who post things that their kids say. Mm -hmm. Like one time one of my colleagues said, her daughter said, I wish that you could just be a mommy and not a doctor. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, I need you. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, Damn, you know, yeah, like so I get it. there are times yeah. when you do feel that, but I think that that can be a tough thing to go through. And at that moment, you know, you might think about if you are doing too much and you do mm -hmm. need to slow down and try to be more around for your kids, like that is a child advocating for themselves. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there are a lot of other people who will try to guilt you into doing things that you can say no to. I always, and I say, like I said in my book. Reserve your yeses, because a lot of times when you say yes to everything, you, you end up saying no to yourself. So you can't say yes to everything. You have to reserve your yeses for things that align with your values, things that are important to you, and things that are not going to take away from your own peace and your own sanity. Yep, and I'm a big fan of, listen, nobody can send me on a guilt trip unless I'm packing my bags to go to. That's so awesome. anytime you feel guilt, it's really good to slow down and work with what's happening inside. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times we tend to attribute our upset to things outside of us. Like this person is making me mad. My kid said something. If, she, if your children said something that you didn't like, there's something inside of you that, got, that really got triggered by that. It's something you may have already known that you just didn't want to look at. <laughs> and they just and that's why our family is such good mirrors. Mm -hmm. And I say that because I've had to work with that in my own family. Mm -hmm feeling like I was the person who had to handle everything and had to step in and it was like oh wait a minute when I stop doing this like I'm less stressed and you guys will figure it out <laughs> you will figure it out right exactly yeah yeah which is it is another form of empowerment mm -hmm. it's important to notice when we start seeing people as small and not capable mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. they can't do it without me or they really need me it's like how are you holding these individuals and their own authority, their own innovation, their own power, their own ability? And and I know for women, we will manufacture some guilt for real. <laughs> like, and it's just, and what it does is it creates an endless cycle where it just second guesses your decision making process. Mm -hmm. You want to do A, but you talk yourself into doing B as if there's some outside authority that's controlling you or your power. And it's the more you start to create that nurturing environment within yourself, the more that you really start to slow down. The more you ask yourself questions you may not feel comfortable um, moving towards, that's where the growth is. But this whole thing of I don't have time, like the whole world slow down. You got time, girl. <laughs> like, right? Now, and, and it's, it's about choices and priorities. What are you choosing? And lots of times we choose other people, we choose work, we choose external circumstances over ourselves. And then something has to happen where, you know, some people can get their lessons lightly. Other people got to run into a tree yeah. before they see it. Right. I'm all about gentle learning.